வணக்கம் வெல்கம் டு திஸ் வீடியோ ஆன் பயோமெக்கானிக்ஸ் வி ஹவ் பின் லுக்கிங் அட் பயோமெக்கானிக்ஸ் ஆஃப் சாஃப்ட் இஷ்யூஸ் ஸ்பெசிஃபிகலி இன் த லாஸ்ட் ஃபியூ கிளாஸஸ் வி ஹவ் பின் லுக்கிங் அட் தி மெக்கானிக்கல் ப்ராப்பர்ட்டிஸ் ஆஃப் டெண்டன்ஸ் வி லுக் அட் ஸ்ட்ரெஸ் ட்ரெயின் ரிலேஷன்ஸ் வி லுக் அட் தி நேச்சர் ஆஃப் டெண்டன் ஃபோர்ஸஸ் அண்ட் we also develop some models of uh, non linear elasticity in the toe region of a tendon in the physiological region the elasticity is not linear the modulus changes with deformation is something that we saw and we develop some models of this so we continue our discussion on uh, mechanics of soft tissues or tendons in particular so in this video we will be looking at intertendinous force transfer how between tendons force can transfer shear for example and one example one critical example of uh, tendon related force transfer or transfer of some mechanical effect due to tendon behavior called finger enslaving then we'll look at possible causes of finger enslavement we will continue this discussion in the next week in much greater detail looking at some research articles on what possibly causes finger enslavement in this video i will just introduce this and give some hints about this topic so when tendons interact with other tendons what happens is that sometimes there is transfer of force between tendons mostly shear force or lateral force transfer that is uh, if there are two tendons that are moving close to each other then they may shear with respect to each other right. and when many muscles connect to a common tendon it is possible that uh, different muscle displacements may happen for example during plantar flexion uh, the medial gastrocnemius and soleus upper neurosis they deform to different levels because of this there might be some some form of sliding between layers of connective tissue lay, between the uh, connective tissue that are parallel to the acting forces this sliding causes shear or shear forces between upper neurosis that are next to each other or adjacent consecutive next to each other upper neurosis that are next to each other but something that uh, we need to keep in mind is force transmission in tendons is mostly assumed to be along the long axis of the tendon where the fibers are oriented along that axis so uh, usually you would assume that most of the force is transmitted longitudinally i mean you would actually assume 100% efficiency in force transmission but that is not a very reasonable expectation right so some forces also get transmitted laterally right so force transmission is assumed or expected to be along the long axis of the tendon mostly mostly this is also met but here we discuss the special case of uh, uh, the situation when tendons shear between each other okay one particularly interesting case of uh, intertendinous force transfer happens in the human hand uh, happens in the hand I mean, even in animal hands but uh, it is the human hand that is of interest for us so happens in the hand in this case what happens is there are these multi compartment muscles located in the forearm whose bellies are located in the forearm that send long tendons to the fingers okay these uh, muscles whose bellies are located in the forearm are called extrinsic muscles because they are external to the hand itself they are in the arm they are in the forearm because of this reason they are called as extrinsic muscles this muscle gives rise to 
multiple tendons, four different tendons that uh, all these four tendons arise from the same muscle. Because of this reason, there is some kind of interconnection between tendons. It is believed that uh, one reason for uh, finger enslavement is this intertendinous connections or uh, you know tender interconnections. What is this enslavement? Suppose let us take uh, the your hand and you can do this exercise on yourself. You try to move only the ring finger. Do not worry about what the other fingers are doing. Do not worry about what the other fingers are doing. Try to do only the ring finger and observe what the other fingers are doing. I do that. I am moving only the ring finger. What I observe is that the other fingers are also moving because I am not actively moving them or stopping them. The other fingers are also moving. This situation in which when one instructed finger is moving, the other non instructed fingers are also moving is called as enslavement or enslaving. This is also called as lack of finger individuation. There is a, there is a, a compromise in the amount of individuation that a finger has. Right. So, enslavement is a measure of finger interdependence. Between finger there is interdependence. Enslaving or enslavement is a measure. If we can quantitatively measure it, this is essentially a measure of finger interdependence. Okay. So, what you have for example, in the hand are these tendons right for example these tendons well, that are supplied yeah. they are all originating actually not shown here that they are uh, going to go through this and through this through this through this right they are all originating in the same muscle right. so uh, in this region it is reasonable for you to expect some amount of shearing between tendons. Okay. So, when one tendon is moving, the other tendon might also move because of purely because of shearing or, uh, or a component of shear causing a one component of longitudinal force. I mean, you have to be very specific, but, uh, but this is not an entirely unexpected situation. This can happen. So, when you want to move the distal phalanges for example, this is the distal phalanges, the segment this is the distal phalanges. Remember we discussed this in the previous weeks, many weeks ago we discussed the anatomy of the hand. Right? When we want to move the distal phalanges, a long muscle connects to this, a tendons from the long muscle connects to this, these uh, segments and then either extends or flexes them, segments. And then you have you know middle phalange, you have the proximal phalange, then you have the metacarpals, you have the carpals and so on and so forth. We discussed all of this while we discussed the anatomy of the hand, remember. Also the muscles of the hand can be divided into two groups, those whose muscle bellies lie in the forearm and those whose muscle bellies lie within the hand itself. Those whose bellies lie within the forearm are called, they are external to the hand and so they are called extrinsic so they are called extrinsic muscles and the intrinsic muscles are those that are internal to the hand are those that are found whose whose bellies are found within the hand these extrinsic muscles are those long flexors and extensors. Right. They are called extrinsic, why are they called extrinsic? I just mentioned this because their belly is located in the forearm. 
So, but if their bellies are located in the forearm, how are they transmitting force to the fingers? Well, through these uh, multiple tendons that pass through a geometrically complicated structure called as uh, the wrist. Right? Some examples of these, uh, you know, extrinsic muscles are given: flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor digitorum profundus, extrinsic digitorum communis. Right? These are the extrinsic group or the ext group. Right? Then those muscles whose bellies are found within the hand and whose tendons are also within the hand are the intrinsic muscles, right? Tenar muscles, hypotenar muscles, interossei and lumbricals. Right? These are small, but uh, their contribution cannot be necessarily underestimated. They are small muscles, but they may have crucial role in providing this extra amount of dexterity and the finesse to the functions of the human hand. Okay. We just discussed what is enslaving, what is this, when you are, well it is either unintended or involuntary movement that is found in um, you know fingers that is called as lack of finger individuation or kinematic enslaving, some form of kinematic enslaving or when you are pressing on an object and close uh, or, or when you are, uh, edit this okay, or when you are pressing on an object or holding an object, the force produced by one finger is also affected by the force produced by the other fingers or one force causes some an effect on other finger forces. So, this is the involuntary or unintended uh, force that is produced by the other non-instructed fingers. For discussion sake, we call the explicitly involved fingers as master fingers and these other force producing fingers that are not instructed as slave fingers. For example, we performed this instruction where I am asking to move the ring finger, the other fingers are moving without instruction and so they are all called, in this particular case they are all called slave fingers. That does not mean that the index finger is a slave, what it means is that for this task, when the instruction is to perform this task with ring finger, index finger, middle finger and little finger are slaves. When the instruction is to perform this task with the index finger, middle ring and little are slaves, index finger is the master finger. So, this depends on the instruction that is given okay, and what the person is following, what the person is doing. Okay. Because of this reason, there is no one to one correspondence between the command given to the individual fingers and the forces that are actually produced. So, if a particular force is actually produced in a finger. Um, that means that is a backworked force. If this is the force that is being produced, that is not necessarily the force that is intended by the brain. Right? So, there is no one-on-one -on -one correspondence between what is intended by the central nervous system, brain or the central nervous system and what the finger is actually doing. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence. So, to produce a particular force, an inverse model some form of an inverse model of this enslavement must be present in the body. So, I need to know how my other fingers are moving when a particular finger is instructed to do a task so that I can avoid this unintended forces. Right? So, uh, uh, the command that is sent to an intended finger should be scaled in accordance with the command that are sent to the other finger. So, there must be some form of, I need to have an idea of what is the amount of enslavement that is present in the, in my hand, right. Okay. So, I can actually measure uh, the enslavement using the fingertip forces, right. It is a quantitative measure, there is a way to quantitatively measure this. This might be due to many factors or maybe a combination of all these factors. What are these factors? 
potentially it may be due to mechanical coupling between tendons that we just discussed right there might be shearing there might be some form of coupling between tendons so peripheral mechanical coupling between tendons that's one possibility the other is it is possible that one motor unit in a muscle supplies force to many fingers or multi digit motor units in the extrinsic flexor and extensor muscles or one motor unit that is capable of supplying fibers and forces to many fingers simultaneously this is called multi digit motor units right. the other possibility is likely central there might be neural factors there might be diverging or differential central commands maybe the neural architecture that controls or the neural structures that control individual fingers themselves are different and are themselves somehow dependent on each other that they cause some form of enslavement we actually don't know which one this is we will discuss part of this in this video and part of this in the next week in much greater detail okay the first cause that we discuss is peripheral mechanical coupling between tendons of the fingers so at the peripheral level the tendons of the fingers are somehow interconnected by fascia type of uh, anatomical structure some tissue that interconnect the tendons right these interconnections are perhaps one of the reasons why it is hard to overcome the enslavement and produce the highly independent finger movements that are required in some string musical instruments or maybe piano these are these are some of the instruments that require individuated finger movements finger movements where one finger is moving relatively independently of other fingers so this this causes physical difficulty right because uh, there is a physical uh, you know barrier that prevents independent movement of uh, the fingers but if that is indeed the case how are these expert musicians performing relatively independent movements now that is a different question that we need to separately discuss we will discuss that in just a little bit consider these fascia like uh, tissues that are shown in this finger for example here there is always this interconnection that you see here for example you know tendons are interconnected here they are there everywhere throughout the hand there is fascia like uh, uh, you know interconnections that could cause some form of shear or some form of force transmission so this is an aspect of morphology or structure or geometry itself morphology itself is causing this limitation but then coming back to the older question how then are the expert pianists performing this independent movements now with practice somehow they are able to perform independent movements that means that they are able to produce compensatory movements in the other finger such that each finger movement appears to be independent maybe so that means that this is something that you can unlearn this is a this is a controversial topic it might appear controversial but it is not controversial it is known that pianists expert pianists and expert string uh, musical instrument players have a different type of enslavement have much lower enslavement so that means that it seems like enslavement can be unlearned uh, uh, that means that this is probably neural but then you know let's not jump let's not immediately form hypothesis and saying oh if, if this is something that i can unlearn that means that it's neural in uh, origin and i will simply unlearn the neural learning uh, for that you also have to rule out the possibility that as you are unlearning there are no morphological changes in the hand perhaps there are no morphological changes in the hand but uh, that is something that we will have to confirm so 
all we know is that expert pianists and string musical instruments do have a low level of enslavement or do have a high degree of finger independence. So, their finger movements and finger actions are relatively more independent than the rest of the typical population, something to keep in mind. The other possibility that we discussed is the possibility that uh, motor units, multi digit motor units, multi digit motor units, but uh, let us discuss what is a motor unit first. Every skeletal muscle receives uh, a command from a neuron or an alpha motor neuron from to, to contract and to produce force. These fibers are the set of all fibers that are innervated by a given alpha motor neuron are called as motor units. If you take any single muscle fiber that is innervated by one and exactly one motor neuron, but one motor neuron can innervate more than one muscle fiber. A given fiber is innervated by exactly one motor neuron, but any given motor neuron can and usually does innervate many fibers. Okay. So, the set of all fibers that are innervated by a single motor neuron is called as a motor unit. Okay. So, here you have this motor neuron and the set of all fibers that are innervated by this uh, motor neuron are all coded in the brown color here. These are all there. This set is the motor unit. Now, let us take these three muscle fibers connect to one tendon, these four muscle fibers connect to another tendon, these four connect to another tendon and these three connect to the fourth tendon. Now, whenever this and the relationship between the motor neuron and the fibers is such that whenever that motor neuron is firing, the fiber must also fire. So, whenever this brown motor neuron is active, all these fibers will contract and a corresponding amount of force will be felt in each of these tendons. And remember, these fibers are not necessarily of the same size, they may be of the same size and they are also not of the same number. Some of them have 4 muscle fibers, some of them have 3. So, the forces will be different. So, this dependence on multi digit motor units or multi tendinous motor units. So, one motor unit supplying to muscle fibers that are connecting to different tendons causes a situation wherein if that motor neuron is activated, all these tendons will become slightly or and differentially activated. This may be a cause of enslavement. This is the second hypothesis reason. Right. For example, uh, multi digit this is found and demonstrated uh, or there is some evidence to suggest that this happens at least in the extrinsic flexor and extren extensor muscles of the human hand, right? because there are many compartments, many different compartments of the same muscle flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis that contain motor units right? and these act on all the four fingers. So, maybe there is some kind of divergence of commands or, uh, or divergence of muscle fibers from these motor units. So, if they are diverging to four different fingers, although only one of them may be activated, all of them because there is divergence of fibers to different tendons, this may cause a difference in either movements or forces, the other hypothesis reason. One more reason comes to us from the idea that uh, in the primary motor cortex in the brain, so primary motor cortex is this area in the brain that is just anterior to the central sulcus. It is believed that the primary motor cortex is responsible for control of movements. 
In the 1930s, an experiment was performed on epilepsy patients or patients who undergo surgery where different regions of the motor cortex was uh, stimulated and which part of the body responded to that stimulation was recorded. And what was found was that uh, different regions were activated by activating different parts of the motor cortex that is something that is expected. But what was also found was that the face, mouth and hand and finger regions, hand and finger occupied a disproportionately large volume of the motor cortex volume. So, although the hand and the face are having a relatively small volume in the whole body, they occupy or they represent, they are represented in a relatively large area or they are the command, the neurons that command these regions are spread over a relatively large area in the motor cortex. This gave rise to the idea that uh, there is a little man or a homunculus present within the uh, motor cortex, but not necessarily having a symmetric size, so, but uh, disproportionately sized little man is present inside or commanding uh, man is present in the human brain. So, uh, so in this model, in this idea, this is of course uh, from the work of uh, Wilder Penfield, neurosurgeon from the 1930s, suggested that there is a hand area, there is a little finger area, there is a ring finger area, there is a middle finger area, there is index finger area, there is a thumb area, suggesting that there may be necessarily some form of boundaries between them. So, if suppose this is the ring finger area, if you stimulate just outside that you will either activate the little finger or you will activate the middle finger, if you stimulate just outside this ring finger area. Uh, this suggests that there might be some form of a boundary. If this is indeed the case, there any cause of enslavement is not likely neural. But this is the 1930s view. More recently, what has been suggested is that in the cerebral cortex, in the motor cortex, these representations are not having stringent or strict boundaries. In particular, between fingers, there is quite a bit of overlap between neurons that command different fingers. If I represent neurons that send command to different fingers in different colors and map this in the brain, it is not like what you would expect from this homunculus model is, let us say this is index finger and these are all the neurons, these are all the index finger neurons. This is the index finger region of the brain, these are all the index finger neurons that I am marking in light blue. Then I have the middle finger neurons that are plotted, that are marked in red. Then I am going to have the ring finger neuron in bright green. Then I have the little finger neuron in purple. Okay. This appears to suggest existence of some form of boundaries between them. There is a boundary here, there is a boundary here, there is a boundary here and there is a boundary here. This is what is suggested by the homunculus model. But what is actually present is not this, what is actually present is and 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 that. Now, what I have within this big black square is looking more like a mosaic of different colors. So, it does not look like if I take a small region 
within this hand area of the brain of the motor cortex right if i take say a small area here will i find only the index finger neurons the answer is no because it's not just blue will i find only the middle finger neurons the answer is no because it's not just red not only green not only purple purple is found everywhere and in this region purple is found uh, green is found everywhere and in this region green is found red is found everywhere and in this region red is found blue is found everywhere and in this region blue is found that means that it is possible that neurons that are neighbor to each other may actually command fingers that are distant from each other let me say that again neurons that are located close to each other in the motor cortex may command fingers that are located far away from each other for example it is possible for a so this is index this is middle this is ring this is little we said so little finger and index finger are far away from each other is it not so in the hand you see that uh, the index finger and little finger are far away from each other right so is it like is it possible for the index finger neurons which are represented in blue and the little finger neurons which are represented in purple to be neighbors in the in a selected region the answer is yes and let me highlight one example of that in yellow color i am highlighting this example right for example here i have circled in yellow two neurons one in blue and one in purple so so fingers that are far away from each other can receive command from neurons that are very close to each other so if a small region of the motor cortex in the brain becomes active then it is possible for that activation to spill over to other neurons that are that are commanding fingers away from each other giving rise to a form of divergence of neural commands from the brain giving rise to a possibility that enslaving might be primarily a neural phenomenon okay this idea has been confirmed by studies on uh, monkeys and by blood flow measurements in humans right so at the central level it might be thought of as that you know that enslavement might be purely a result of cortical organization some form of organization leading to some form of coactivation between muscles that are sending uh, commands to different fingers okay that are sending commands to different fingers are receiving commands at the same time because they these two neurons are located close to each other and that region of the brain is active for some reason so maybe this might be purely because of divergence in the central cortical commands maybe this is the other hypothesis that we came out with so we still don't know and it is beyond our uh, scope in this uh, video and in in this week to study about the possible causes of this enslavement we dedicate practically one entire week to studying the possible causes of enslavement which is next week i'll be discussing two research papers in great detail and discuss the possible causes of lack of finger individuation or enslavement okay if you are interested in uh, the neural topics that i just discussed if that inspires you and if you are interested in the neural control of movement i recommend that you consider taking my other course that is uh, offered in the july to november semester the name of the course is neuroscience of human movements usually it is offered in the july to december semester in npetal swayam okay those who are liking this uh, those who are interested in this neural control of movement or in this how the brain controls movement 
I strongly recommend my other course on uh, neuroscience of human movements. So, in this video, we saw what is uh, intertendinous uh, transfer of force or lateral force transmission or shear force transmission. We looked at uh, what is finger enslavement and what are the possible causes of finger enslavement. We looked at what is a motor unit, what are motor units that supply to many digits, multi digit motor units, and uh, we also looked at a possible cause of uh, enslavement in the form of somatotopic, somatotopic means somato means body, topic means map or the body map representation or the body map organization or the presence of a mosaic organization of the body in particularly the hand as one of the other causes of enslavement. So, with this we come to the end of this video, thank you very much for your attention.